गपशप के साथ तो एक कप चाय बनती है मसाला चाय इलायची लौंग और दालचीनी इसको कूट लें उबलते पानी में डालें इसके अंदर चाय की पत्ती और चीनी डालिए बढ़िया मसाला चाय बनाने का मेरा एक छोटा सा राज है ताजे दूध से बना रेनबो इवेपोरेटेड मिल्क इसका रिच और क्रीमी टेस्ट चाय में जान डाल दे ये हुई ना मसालेदार बात रेनबो इवेपोरेटेड मिल्क चाय का परफेक्ट मैच रेनबो टॉप कॉन सीजन टू presented by Nokia powered by Audi Today's top gun is Shaji Ul Mulk founder and owner of Mulk Holdings and the Alubond brand of aluminum composite panels which is the world's largest It seems Shaji never really wanted to work when he came to the UAE he just wanted to play Shaji Ul Mulk is among the 100 most powerful Indians living in the Middle East and his position keeps rising with each passing year. Hello and welcome to Rainbow Top Guns. I'm your host Shane Phillips and today I'm with Shaji Ul Mulk, the founder of Mulk Holdings. Shaji, welcome to Rainbow Top Guns. Hello Shane. Coming up to your facility is so huge. It actually has its own canal on site and in fact you service the entire world from this location here in United Arab Emirates across four separate lines you have manufacturing you have solar energy healthcare and real estate we're all dying to know how did this all start well chen uh, the start is a 30 year story uh, starts from 1982 if i really think about it uh, the whole business journey uh has maybe three parts there's a phase when i came in as a young student 21 years old uh wanting to get an visa uh to the states because you see when i graduated uh, i wasn't getting a you know, visa to the uh usa for my mba education and then i had my sister here mm -hmm. and she said okay when you come over and then kind of try from here and mm -hmm. that's how i landed in dubai you in 1982 landed in dubai. But I think like most young men you were more focused on sports. Luckily or uh, unluckily I didn't have the responsibility back home at that time where you know I had to earn for my living. The time was more into playing sports, uh badminton all the time. I was spending like 6 hours a day wow. in the training or playing. And uh, I was playing cricket very uh, with passion and then badminton both. So that initial phase was more focused on playing all the time. <laughs> Right actually. And what school did you end up getting into in the US? Well, I did get into Watson uh, University of Pennsylvania. And uh, it so happened that by the time I got my admission into the university and then about one and a half years had passed. And then by that time uh, since I was so much into sports and uh, you know the focus simply wasn't there. Okay, and you decided not to go to Wharton in the end. Yes, I did get an advice from one of my very close friends. Uh, and uh i'm in the situation where i'm here i've started to work and then i've got this admission but then i'm not really sure what to do so my friend asked me one question what do you want to be are you studying because you want to be a professional or are you studying because you want to be a businessman uh, that part was very clear for me from day one i wanted to be a businessman or to want to be in business i said yeah I'm studying because I can be a good businessman. Then he said, "Then don't go. You spend two or three years studying, and then the two or three years you can put in your business, and perhaps uh, the uh, experience you will get in that will be better than your studies." And I didn't go. But this is because you had a vision early on of where you wanted to go, but you did know that you wanted to be a businessman, and that helped guide your decision making. Sure, the goal and the aspirations were very clear from the beginning business is what i wanted to be 
But in any case, the first eight years of my career in Dubai was basically not very focused in business and playing sports most of the time, doing work, but at a very small level. And then something uh, did happen where, uh, you know, the focus changed. So where was the watershed? What was the moment that clicked and you said, time to put the cricket bat down and get to serious business? I married in 1987, and then some, sometime in early 1989, my wife came back from one of the parties, and she came back and told me, I got introduced as a cricketer's wife. I don't like it. And I think that was the moment which I actually started thinking, yes, I need to be somebody in life. So your wife is one of the main drivers, your, your inspiration, the, the air under your wings, if you will. Yes, absolutely. She has been a driving force uh, in my entire journey of uh, my business and my career. What are the first few steps this, of, of, that start this journey? Well, I think it's all the mindset. When that did happen, and I started thinking, because, okay, it's not that I wasn't into business. I was into business. I was running a small company. I had 20 people working for me. What were you, what were you running? We were doing uh, interior decorations. This okay. is back in late 80s. The company was called uh, Hassan Ali Abdullah Interiors. Okay. But that's the time I thought, uh, yeah, it's time that I took my career seriously and started thinking big. Yeah, that's the difference. People say your greatest asset in life is your ambition. That that's your fuel, and, and I mean, that's really changing how you're thinking, where you're going. You know, I think the people who get to the top to the mountain are the ones who aspire to get there. Do you, do you agree with that, or, or what's your take? On well, ambition is important. I mean, that's how you actually start thinking. Uh, ambition sets your goals, right? And this again was what uh, my first job, or a leap, as you can say, into something bigger, was an opportunity came in the 90s where an English company called uh, Gordon Brown, they were giving out licenses to manufacture ceiling tiles, basically. So I had some savings to set up a very small scale ceiling tiles manufacturing facility. And that's how my business career started as a manufacturer. So my manufacturing experience actually starts back in uh, 89. And so you, did you leave Hassan Ali Abdullah to start the tile company or was that part of under, under the wing of? Oh, under the same company actually. Okay. Under the same company just started another division of uh, ceiling tiles. And then obviously then being a manufacturer, the company grew. We grew from a 20 to a 50 people company. Uh, this phase uh, continued until 91, actually. So that's my one first part of the uh, three parts of my story, like I was telling sure. you. To me, success is defined as simply getting up one more time than you've been knocked down. In that first decade of work, how many times had you been knocked down? Well, uh, I do remember the incident. You see, when the, my goals were set, and I wanted to be bigger than what I was, then sometimes you also act without thinking. An opportunity came to set up a branch uh, of my ceiling tiles manufacturing in Oman. And I met an Omani uh, uh, businessman, and he said, okay, Shaji, come over, and let's have a uh, set up in Oman. I went in. Uh, took my perhaps more than 50% of my earnings, invested there, and set up a unit for him. And then as so happened, the guy did not have the proper business ethics. And once I set it up, he said, thank you very much. And I went in without any legal protection, so I did lose a lot. And legally, the business was in his name, and then he said, thank you very much once it's up and running. Absolutely. So my earnings went less than half. Wow. Uh, in one shot. How do you deal with the psychological and emotional impact of losing that kind of money? It's more from an attitude of, you made a mistake, uh, it's a learning curve, and then my attitude was, yes, you learn from mistakes. And next time you make sure that you're doing it right. In uh, prefab, I reached a stage where the company was doing very well, and I simply thought that I could do a lot more if I was my own boss again. And one fine day, I sat with my partner and said, 
this is the company, it was well established, and you run it, and I left. Presented by Nokia, powered by Audi. Around the world, millions of people are switching to Nokia Lumia. For the best smartphone photography in low light. <laughs> for easy wireless charging. And for city lanes to explore the world around them. <laughs> Time to switch. Rainbow Top Gun Season 2. To continue the interview, we decided to meet on his multi-million dollar yacht anchored in the Dubai Creek. In fact, Shaji is quite fond of having his meetings aboard this elegant boat. I thought it was a great idea and I was not wrong. So you pick yourself up from a partnership which slightly soured in Oman, dust yourself off, and get ready for the next phase of your business's growth. Tell us a little bit about what happened next. I kind of figured that the resources that I had were not large enough to be a big businessman or the level of business that I wanted to do. So the rationale was try and find a bigger partner. And uh, during that phase of my career, my company had already landed a very large contract uh, with the Bakar group of companies. So Tayo Bakar, who was my uh, future partner, then I met him and said, look, I've got the last contract to execute, and then my company is too small to do that. So there's a choice. You can take me as a partner, and then I'll grow the company. So the, he liked the idea, and that's how Hassan Ali Abdullah, which is my smaller company, got merged into prefab building industries, uh, which became a much larger company. So that was the birth of prefab building industries. That's right. Which is the second stage of your business evolution. Absolutely. I mean, that's a company uh, which actually taught me what is corporate governance. And because uh, a large company was backing my company, we started uh, getting huge contracts like, you know, the Dubai International Airport and big buildings. So as time progressed, the 50 people company turned into a thousand people company. Wow. Started off with ceilings and partitions, but then we evolved the company into going into exterior claddings, which is the aluminum composite panels. And as technologies improved and aluminum composite panels started hitting the market, so we had a chance to acquire an agency for an American company called Renobond. And then we also were manufacturing the glass reinforced concrete panels and uh, got into manufacturing uh, ceiling components as well. Right. So the company kind of became a manufacturing com installation company. Right. And uh, in our trade, I think uh, during that period, we were the largest uh, subcontracting company in the UAE. So as you went through this vertical ascent, white knuckle explosive growth through the company, what was the biggest challenge you faced? Deadlines. Deadlines were always the biggest challenge. I remember a contract uh, which is the uh, TD48, uh, the Terminal 1 airport. We had nine months to complete and we needed to deploy 500 people and something like 25 engineers and everything had to happen in nine months. Wow. So those kind of deadlines and challenges were very interesting. And no matter how, how fast the company was growing, it almost seems that you wanted to grow faster. And no matter how big the company got, you wanted the company to get bigger. Yeah, I suppose uh, you can relate that ambition and that uh, desire to grow to actually the formation of the Mulk Holdings. I left that company. You left prefab that building industries. After the huge <laughs> success story. Absolutely, yeah. And what was the trigger that caused you to start Mulk Holding? Well, basically the drive to do more. And in uh, prefab, I reached a stage where the company was doing very well, in fact. I was a minority shareholder. 
I was 40% share in the company. And I simply thought that I could do a lot more if I was my own boss again. And uh, so one fine day I sat with my partner and said, uh, uh, I want to be on my own. And this is a company is well established and you run it. And I left. And that's how I started the Mold Calling first company, came to Ajman Free Zone, put up uh, Eurocon Building Industries, took the license. You see, at that time, an opportunity came at Aluban uh, USA, the brand, the American company. There was an opportunity to buy some shares there. So the company was owned by a gentleman called Robert Gustafson, still a good friend, Bob. And uh, I took a small share at that time. Uh, that share gave me with an understanding that I'll have the agency of distributing Alban in the entire GCC. Okay. So this company started off as a distributor start. So one year we imported the brand, started uh, selling into the GCC markets as a trader. And then the way the business picked up, gave us the conference to put up the first manufacturing plant of Alban uh, in 2002. And we were just so successful that in the first uh, three years, we actually tripled our production. So first line came in 2002, and every year there was a new line we were installing. The next three years, we had triple of, uh, you know, the original uh, production. Ambition to go global with manufacturing activities is what drives Shaji to keep growing. Can you tell us a little bit about what the international footprint of the company looks like today? We sell in pretty much 90 countries around the world. But then in terms of manufacturing basis, uh, we've got a base which we opened last November in uh, Europe. We've got a production base in Turkey, in Sri Lanka, in India, and of course the UAE. And uh, the new bases which are coming up in the next two years would be in Russia and Saudi Arabia as well. And then uh, the way we operate is for all these bases, we have a network of distributors, almost in about uh, 60 distributors who sell in like I said, in 90 countries. So that's how the Alaban size is today. So initially you bought a small share of Alubon, but today you own the brand outright. Can you tell us a little bit about that journey? As Alubon grew, and then we acquired the manufacturing uh, rights in the sense that we could set up Alubon manufacturing units in any part of the world. And then Bob, uh, who owned uh, ABTI, the company which uh, has the Alubon brand ownership. Now, he was also a partner in some of the hotel investments we did in the US. So we had this chain in Daydin, and uh, as luck would have it, he got interested more in the hotels. So we kind of sat down like friends and said, Bob said, okay, he wants the hotels. And I said, okay, I want the Alubon. We swapped. Okay. So I gave him the hotels that I had, and he gave me the Alubon brand rights. And uh, is he kicking himself that he chose the hotels over the Alubon? Well, I don't know about that, but then he's a nice guy. And the last time I met him, we had a quick chat about this. And he did tell me, look, Shaji, you took a big cake from me. And I said, I gave you a bigger size. I gave you a hotel. <laughs> we had a laugh, and that's about it, you know? Right. There's more to Shuji Ulmog than just business. Coming up, we'll be hearing about his family life and his community involvement. So stay with us. If you give education to a kid, now imagine his life and his next generation when he becomes somebody. And that's the change which is the most significant rather than a personal ambition. That's how I look at it. Presented by Nokia, powered by Audi. Supported by the intelligent SME. Official radio partner Suno 1024 and Super 94.7 FM. Around the world, millions of people are switching to Nokia Lumia for the best smartphone photography in low light. <laughs> for easy wireless charging. And for city lanes to explore the world around them. <laughs> Time to switch.
The Audi A8. Always first class. पुराने गाने पुराने दोस्त घर की यादें और इलायची चाय उबलते पानी में इलायची चाय की पत्ती और चीनी डालें कुछ देर गैस पे उबलने दें इलायची चाय तभी अच्छी बनेगी जब आप यूज करेंगे रेनबो इवेपोरेटेड मिल्क जो बना है ताजे दूध से इसका रिच और क्रीमी टेस्ट चाय में जान डाल दे इतना सिंपल घर की याद दिला दी रेनबो इवेपोरेटेड मिल्क चाय का परफेक्ट मैच Rainbow Top Gun Season 2. Hello and welcome back to Rainbow Top Guns. I'm here with Saji Olmulk, the founder of Mulk Holdings. Saji, welcome back to the show. Hi. So, how you basically took Alu Bond from a lager pack lager brand right up to the top to the market leader. But what about all the other segments of your business? You're in manufacturing, you're in solar Uh, energy. You're in healthcare. You're in real estate. How did these other divisions start? Well, it's been a natural progression because Alubon, as it's growing, uh, a lot of backward and forward integration happened. For example, uh, you know, we're using crazy amounts of uh, aluminium coils. I mean, our consumption went up to something like 15 to 20 thousand tons a month. Then it was a natural, uh, logical sense that you become an aluminium coil coater. So we put up the Mulk Litong, which is the Coil coating industry, and then the same thing with the plastic being our core product. In the UAE alone, we are buying from at least five industries 100% of the production. And uh, as the technology evolved, like my son now Adnan, now he joined in and he said, "Look, the regulations in the country are changing, and it's all fire-rated now. So we should get into compounding and fire-rated uh, granules production." So he's taken that industry up, and we were successful in actually developing, for the first time, a metal mirror. In terms of a glass mirror, so solar energy is all about mirrors. Then we said we don't want to be just a supplier of mirrors. Let's get into design technology, EPC, and we got full swing into solar energy as a designer and a manufacturer of the entire systems. Wow. So that's how the solar energy happened. And the solar energy now is a seed for what's on the horizon for your organization. Now you're flirting with the idea of getting into power generation as a whole. Absolutely, that's our next uh, sector. I mean, we have identified areas, uh, particularly the African market. And since you are an energy business, so it's part of an extension. So that's been a Mulk Holdings philosophy. Once you are into a sector, we are trying to expand and uh, diversify within the sector into further industries. One of the things I really love about your story is it seems like the bedrock of your success is really the strength you find from your family. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely, family is uh, very, very important for me. You know, the whole uh, growth, professionally and personally, has been family-driven. And uh, talk about business. My wife is being a support, and uh, as a position, she's the deputy chairperson of the group and in charge of the entire uh, admin. And the son is already involved into business. That's the professional side. But then, uh, on a personal side, the five of us, as a family, the group, we are perfectly happy going on a vacation, going on a party, and we thoroughly enjoy our group. I discovered the man who splurged on his daughter's wedding ceremonies also believes in giving back to society in his own unique way. It's very admirable the work that you do in the community and how involved you are. Can you tell us a little bit about your community projects? Well, talking about uh, community service is something which I don't want to talk much about it, but it's something which I personally feel very satisfied doing it. We've had this tradition in my hometown. We get the orphan girls uh, married, and this program has become so big now. The last uh, function we had, we had about 30 uh, girls married. And we had 10,000 people wow. attending that function. Unbelievable, because they wouldn't have an opportunity to have a wedding like that any other way. Well, I think that's part of uh, how you feel satisfied that you're doing something for somebody else, and you are able to give something back. You know, the God has been kind to us, and I think it's all our moral responsibility to give something back to the society. 
And don't forget, I think uh, what is also important is if you are able to change an underprivileged life, you're not changing just his life, you're changing the entire generation. And that's very important. If you give education to a kid, now imagine his life and his next generation when he becomes somebody. And that's the change which is the most significant rather than a personal ambition. That's how I look at it. Setting the foundation of a healthy community, absolutely. And I think, you know, in your heart and part of your DNA, you're also a sportsman. And I think you also use sports to touch the community as well, don't you? Yeah, that's been a very, very strong program for myself and the company. You know, in terms of uh, sports uh, uh, in UAE, the Admar Credit Council has been funded by us. We've helped building about uh, 10 grounds where uh, the expats who love cricket come and play every Friday there. So we are doing some good work where eventually we're hoping that one day we will be able to change the way cricket is played here and turn the, our cricketers into full-time professionals. My dad's always been a down-to-earth person. He's reminded us about family values, about how to give people, how to be generous. There's one thing which I really cherish, that I played cricket with my dad. We used to go to matches together every Friday, and uh, it, was, it was a great feeling just to perform together. And uh, we used to make our team win the matches as well. I always think in terms of leadership lessons, there's more learned in the sports field than in the classroom, because as a captain of a sports team, you have to lead a group to uh, achieve a goal. You have to lead a group under pressure. You have to lead the group through very emotional moments. Do you feel that maybe some of your biggest leadership lessons have been learned on the sports field? I suppose it's inherent. You know, when you are on a sports field, then the emotions you go through in a game, right from the, the times when you're turning your near defeat into a, a win, and the times when you're winning and you take it easy, and before you know anything, you lost it. So this is very typical of how things can go wrong uh, if you're not focused from the professional perspective. And the same way that uh, the strategy, like you said, uh, leading a group of people, motivating them as a cohesive unit, is all part of what team building is all about. So yes, I agree. Sports and business are very, very correlated. And what is your advice to those of us who want to follow in your footsteps? I would advise two things. You know, the first thing is believe in yourself is very important. You need to believe in yourself that you can achieve what you dream. That's a very, very firm belief. But once you've done that, Always over deliver on your promise. If you can stick to your promise and just deliver your promise, I think you cannot go wrong. Go ahead, believe in yourself, and over deliver on your promise. So there you have it. Believe in yourself, chase your dreams, and remember to always over deliver on what you promise. It's the Shaji Ulmulk success formula. I hope you're enjoying the episodes thus far. But more importantly, I hope they're inspiring you. This is your host, Shane Phillips, signing off. It was first setting up your sales and distribution. Yeah. Second yeah. process Second. was getting a product that gave you a competitive positioning. And then third is owning and developing the infrastructure underneath. Yeah, I think the most important of all this was actually brand building. There were a lot of competitive brands at the time. But then for us to be there and compete against the top brands. So we took a very clear decision that we have to build the brand first. We wanted to create a brand which offers more than what people pay for it. That was the whole motto behind creating Alubant.